I'm Carl DeSantis and uh, fortunate enough to be an adjunct English teacher at uh, Edison Community College. And through that relationship, uh, the opportunity to speak to my experience as a GI back in the 60s, uh, uh, brought into the U.S. Army by Uncle Sam and uh, discharged by 1972 out of Vietnam service. Uh, probably wore the, uh, the green, uh, the, my gold bar as a second lieutenant here. Uh, had a silver bar by the time I left as a first lieutenant uh, from the United States Army. My uh, induction into the Army was in 1969 after a number of years of deferments. I always like to say they were the same number of deferments as uh, the former Vice President Dick Cheney, uh, although uh, he didn't have the uh, last opportunity to actually be inducted. Perhaps it was his heart. Uh, I will say my heart was in it. Uh, my father was a World War II vet landed on Saipan, U.S. Army, uh, ended up as a captain and uh, involved with prisoners of war in World War II, mostly Italian. So when uh, he dropped me off at the induction office in Memphis, Tennessee in 1969, uh, August, at the age of 23, an old man for that situation, uh, he said, good luck, son, see you on the other end. And uh, so in Memphis, Tennessee, as unlike uh, much of the other parts of the country, uh, we didn't have the protests. Uh, we'd had the uh, awful tragedy of Martin Luther King's assassination the year before, 1968, in Memphis. Uh, even the reaction to that were not as uh, difficult as they had been in other cities. The actually perhaps uh, gun-ho feeling, the uh, sense of pride, the American spirit, the patriotism was uh, extremely strong in, in the South uh, and manifested there in Memphis. Uh, so the odd person who uh, questioned why you were going in and not going to Canada uh, was odd indeed. The only person that challenged me and questioned me was my director of broadcasting. I was in graduate school as a, a broadcaster. I was a director for an NBC affiliate in Memphis, Tennessee at the same time. And uh, with a career in front of me and my director of broadcasting at Memphis State asked me why I wasn't going to Canada. Well, he was from New York City. Uh, he had been a writer for a radio series in the 40s. Uh, I don't know his position had been at the end of World War II because he would have been an adult. Uh, however, uh, I was surprised he questioned my loyalty or my patriotism when he mentioned Canada. Uh, but I gave great, great respect for him. Uh, in the end, perhaps, in a political fashion, uh, perhaps he was right. Not about going to Canada, not about escaping, not about being a, a turncoat, uh, but perhaps about decisions about that war itself. Uh, as one grows older, one looks back on history and reflects on the decisions that were made in one way or another. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, story of Vietnam has been told many, many times. Uh, mine is not a one of uh, battle directly uh, in the rice paddies and the heat of the moment and the deltas. Uh, mine is one uh, later. Uh, sometimes uh, the ones of my generation will complain that the ones that went in in 64 and 65 started it all and then we had to mop it all up. Uh, they were in the heat of it right through 68, as we know, as when Walter Cronkite began to share questions about our involvement. And by uh, 73, 74, 75, we were leaving, and of course, uh, that very difficult scene of that helicopter as we finally left uh, after the presidency of Nixon was over and Ford was in office. However, in the meantime, um, as I went in, I was not aware of the uh, protest action other than what briefly had been seen on television news, which was very primitive compared to today to cable 24-7. And uh, so I was looking forward to the adventure. I'd been in school, it seemed like forever. Um, and uh, so it was an exciting opportunity in a way. Uh, I did not fear the possibility of, of Vietnam, I almost looked forward to it. And after uh, a year of basic training and OCS officer candidate training, six months of that at Fort Benning, and then duty station at Fort Bragg, I got my orders for Vietnam, sold the brand new car, and headed over for excitement, uh, strange enough. So I told you I was 23 when I went in. That's an old man going in. So in the barracks back in basic training, I had 17 and 18 year olds who uh, could have been, you know, like my children in comparison to my educated stas status. So it was a challenging time social-wise, you might say. But once I was over there in Vietnam, we were all the same, E7, E4, E2, E6, whatever it was, you're all in this together. Uh, generals uh, looked at you as uh, part of the process, uh, not part of the problem. And uh, so my position initially uh, was to get acquainted in country, 
That's a term we used in country as opposed to back here, it was called the world. And we um, had to go through training all over again in Vietnam relative to what we would anticipate, including uh, the different uh, uh, wire entrapments, uh, different possible booby traps and uh, types of weaponry that we would face that were not conventional. Uh, we've been trained somewhat World War II-like, except for some of it Vietnam-like, and so we had to be retrained into what it was really going to be. Uh, as a first lieutenant, uh, I uh, could have been in several different positions. I had been commissioned signal communications out of Fort Benning, but served with an infantry battalion outside of Da Nang on a hill called Maud Hill. All the hills had names, all the hills had numbers. And when I re re arrived there in country, went through this initial training uh, after having gone from uh, the uh, airport there outside of Saigon up to Cam Ranh Bay, to Nha Trang, up to Da Nang, and then out to my hill, I now was in a position of uh, daytime communication uh, coordinator, you might say, with my rear experience, two and three term tour men who were used to what they were doing and had been through the heat of it and now were almost enjoying the luxury of being on a fire base. And my job at the day time was to supervise the communication facilities. By night, I was the night base commander. So I had about five hours of sleep each day from about seven in the morning till 12 and a little, uh, and a board underneath sandbags uh, next to the mortar pit, slept like a baby. Uh, I was, uh, so here I was uh, in the real place in sight of the South China Sea, looking down over this vast land. Uh, at nighttime, my job was to coordinate the artillery fire from uh, the other end of the fire base, 100 yards away, into protecting our men down in the fields, in the rice paddies, in the heat of it. And uh, so they would take our, our coordinates would come from them in the field. We would then relay this information carefully to the uh, artillery fellows. They would uh, use a computer of the time, this is late 60s, a computer of uh, sorts, and locate the uh, particular coordinates and then let fire. And sometimes that fire went right over our heads, uh, direct angle, and broke sound barriers, sometimes knocked everything off we had, but uh, we knew we were in good hands. Uh, and talking about in good hands, uh, uh, there was uh, never a moment really that I felt uh, ultimately threatened. Uh, we had incoming, it was scattered, it was misfired, it was misaimed. Uh, we had a lot of advance warning sometimes because of where we could see, especially at night. We had a lot of protection from Apaches and uh, big uh, and helicopters screening the hills and blowing holes in the hills. And then we blew the other hills with those artillery pieces. When the Chinooks landed on our fire base, uh, they would sit down and end to end be at the width of our entire fire base. Uh, and when they lifted off with 30 guys, they were full. They went very slow. And when you flew over other fire bases and those things and looked out, uh, you saw other crashed uh, Chinooks. It was better to be in a Huey when you got on and got off real fast, no doors in your way. And uh, those I liked because I knew we were going places fast and we were going to be off and on. The Chinooks were a big target. They are to today. But it's the only way you can convey or take uh, all those number of men and equipment and facilities uh, in, uh, over uh, an area that you need to actually traverse very relatively quickly and you need to do it in large numbers. The, um, like I said, I did not leave a protesting situation. Uh, uh, the, uh, the girlfriend had been uh, a, a breakup situation, so I left that behind. My mother had passed the year before and now was home with her Lord. Uh, my dad, World Tour World uh, Two vet, uh, was a, encouraged me to do the best I could and uh, just uh, uh, again, represent the country and the family as all his brothers had served as well. Uh, so it was a good send off um, after I was in basic training in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Uh, <laughs> called my dad one time and he said, well, your number on this new thing called the lottery came up anyways, so you were in, so stay at it, son. Uh, putting that all together gives you a different perspective than uh, men that I met later when I got out who had been on the other side, the peaceniks. In fact, uh, I've worked with men in my area of education who are nearly my age who were protesting in New York City and other cities across the country and taking over campuses like at Columbia and perhaps uh, burning things like draft cards. Uh, and they were at the height of the protest and then at our later ages, now in our 60s, uh, some of them are our best representatives of the veterans. Uh, we've come to a tremendous sense of who we are and what we stood for and we respect each other greatly. And we respect our commander-in-chief. We may not always agree with him, whoever the commander-in-chief may be, but we respect the office. 
Uh, through those years, uh, one gets to look back at uh, what effect uh, each war has had on the society. And a person recently told me after the Civil War, uh, we can't get every idea, but we got a pretty good impression that it took a few years and then things went back to pretty much normal American life. And the industrial uh, aspect grew mightily. World War I, uh, back to what I might consider normal life, the Roaring Twenties. The Depression set the place for World War II, went through this uh, horrific worldwide battle, again victory over the enemy, and life went back to what could considered normal, in fact excelled to the 50s. Vietnam, despite its pain in the country and division, uh, we went back to the way life pretty much was and lived those ways in the 60s and the 70s. And then eventually we would approach the 90s and be anticipating um, not that the worst would happen, but the incredible economy would grow. And then there was 9-11. All those other wars set a pace that life has gone on pretty much the way it had been before those wars. Uh, now, as people have said, it'll never be the same again. Never be the same again. Uh, we are in a status with this present uh, warrior, this present enemy, uh, which uh, may be for all the duration of each of our lives. So things have never gone back to normal since 9-11. And there's a lot of things and emblems and so forth. Uh, we can remember those tremendous times of 9-11 with the, the soldiers that still fight today to, uh, to protect and to guard and to defend those uh, liberties that we have. And this piece here from the World Trade Center, of course, uh, reminds us of that tragedy that day, and we've just recently celebrated that again. We've also known that there's a lot of opportunities for veterans to... Um, be sharing their stories and to be welcomed back. Uh, a couple years ago, Wright Pat Air Force Base, uh, <coughs> the museum opened its doors to a welcome back Vietnam vets. And uh, my wife and I went to this and there were thousands of vets from all parts of the service who were saluted and welcomed back in a tremendous service and a tremendous uh, opportunity. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, the Troy uh, Strawberry Festival, Vietnam vets were the um, uh, the Grand Marshals, and we were welcomed back as we rode in those deuce and a halfs one more time. And recently, we've had the opportunity to even represent the Veterans Museum as volunteers at the uh, Munford and Sons uh, concert that was in Troy on the Labor Day weekend. Again, raising money for the Veterans Museum in Troy, tremendous. When I think about museums, I think about some of the artifacts that I brought back. I worked with the Montagnards, which are indigenous, they're like our Native Americans. And uh, these are some of the items that they built, they made. And I would uh, acquire them as mementos in my second half of my tour as a protocol officer and give them to generals like General Westmoreland and other people who would visit. And they would make these things and then we would take them into play coup, which is a two core area. And we would have them, um, different plaques put on them with their name and their rank and their position. And they're pretty incredible uh, items as you can see here but they were all made by the Montagnards, by these what we would call Indians, and even this uh, sleeve that they would fit in here, and we would present those. Here's a bit more of an unusual one. In fact, it was all wood and uh, different items that have stayed with me all the way now for 40-some years. So my, uh, my look now is uh, I got out of the Army back in 72. I went right back into normal life, uh, left Memphis, went to Buffalo, got back in my career as a broadcast director, and life went on. Uh, didn't look back. Uh, didn't uh, have those uh, problems and challenges that our men have today, whether Vietnam vets, whether they're first Gulf War, or whether they're Afghan Iraq vets. And uh, we just salute each one of those. Uh, we give them a tremendous uh, sense of thank you for your service. Uh, I think all the men and women who have faced the challenges of life through these years, uh, we owe them a great, tremendous deal of respect. Uh, we owe them a salute, and I salute you. Thank you. My experiences in um, Vietnam, I was there for a year. Uh, I was Navy, but I was also a Marine because on our ship we had a Marine. They call it a floating battalion, but there wasn't a battalion on board. Um, and what my job was with those guys was to be an ammo humper. But going back, the reason why I went in the Navy was in about 1963, um, I was in high school. I just turned 17 and I was to write a paper for an English class and I like to write and I wrote this paper. I, I didn't put a lot of maybe thought into it 
and I turned it into my English teacher and she failed me on it and that made me ineligible for football that's the only reason why I ever was in school to begin with I was a good baseball football player and I asked her about it and she said well it was a okay paper but you could do better and I said well I'll tell you what about doing better I'm out of here and I went home we had a little farm and I told my dad I said pop I'm not going back and he said okay go get in a car I said, all right so I got in a car and I said where are we going he said you'll see and we pulled up in front of a recruiter station and he said now where are you going and I said uh, yes you was in the Navy dad I'll go so at the ripe old age of 17 just had turned 17 I went Navy and my dad was in the Navy in World War II and he was in a specialized group he was called armed guard and what that is is there were merchant ships and the Navy put um, armed guard on there to man the guns as well as the radios they were signalmen and the reason why for that is that they got a lot of um, coded messages and it wasn't the civilian Navy didn't need to know that it was strictly for for that and I heard a lot of the things about my dad talking about um, his time in the Navy about making the Murmansk run um, uh, just all of his stories and it kind of fascinated them with with the ocean and I thought well and dad always had this saying that he wanted three hots in a cot and I thought yeah that sounds pretty good and I like that idea too so at the ripe old age I uh, at 17 I joined the Navy and I went to Great Lakes for my boot training uh, that was kind of tough because I, I'd spent nights away from home but I had never been as far as Chicago Illinois and it was over the Christmas break, Christmas time, December, January. And if you've ever been up, we called it Great Mistakes, but if you've ever been up there uh, on the lakes in December, January, it is cold. And I remember those guys waking us up at like, we call it Old Dark 30. And we went out and we stood watch on the lake. And they're saying we're at war with Vietnam and we're looking for Vietnamese submarines to come into the bay. And we're all looking at one another thinking, well, where is, I've never heard of Vietnam. What, what is, how come it's not on the news, but you know, what's going on with this? So after my boot training, then I got a ship out of um, Norfolk, Virginia. It was the Independence, USS Independence carrier, CVA 62. Um, and I went into engineering thinking I was going to be a, a boiler or I'm sorry be a diesel mechanic what I really wanted to do well they told me since you quit school um, you're probably not going to go to what they call an A school instead we're going to put you in the boiler room so I basically I wound up then in the boiler room as a boiler technician but later on I wound up as a boiler maker uh, you had to be a second class or above to be a boiler maker and I was at that time what they call an E2. You had to be an E2 or above to serve on a ship. And this plays into my story a little bit later on. Um, when I got on the carrier, she was going through a major yard period with the boilers and we um, uh, rebricked the boilers. We worked on the boilers. But in the meantime, my division officer, I was walking down a passageway, and I've always been a pretty good sized guy. Never in my life have I ever been small. And my division officer said, oh, I've been looking for you, Skinner. And I said, yes, sir. He said, we're sending you to Damn Neck, Virginia. Now, Damn Neck, Virginia is where they train small boats. Um, like the swift boats, they called them, or the riverines, or whatever. And I thought, yeah, that's what I wanted anyway. There were smaller boats, there were wood boats slow boats and I thought this is what I'm going to do. When I got down there I ran into the probably the meanest nastiest gunnery sergeant I think of my life and I told him that I'm not a marine that I was here for small boat duty and he said wrong you're here to be an ammo humper and I kind of looked at him now the marines at that time they were wearing greens we, we called the herringbone greens or utilities but I was in blues blue tambury shirt blue pants and all like that and I said okay wait a minute here Gunny well, I got a problem with this you guys at least got green on I've got blue on and I'm six foot and I weigh well over 200 pounds you think I'm not a target for some and I'm going to use this term because we did back then uh, some dink to pop me I, I don't think so uh-huh 
Then I went on to tell this gunnery sergeant, if the Marines are stupid enough to use up all of their ammunition out here, then you can come back and find me behind the biggest rock I'm hiding behind and I'll just sort of hand it to you. Um, my goal was to come home with the same amount of holes that I went over with, you know, nose holes and ear holes and all like that. He didn't like that idea, but that's the way it went. So we set sail in 1964, late in 64, got in, in country in 1965. One of the things that I really remember, there's two things that I will take to my grave, I remember to this day. Um, the song Under the Boardwalk was playing the day that I found out that I was being shipped to Vietnam. So I guess I, guess I have maybe a love-hate relationship with that song. Um, but from that point on then, I've always kind of liked the doo-wop music, but I still, the, the, the jury's still out on <laughs> Under the Boardwalk. And the, first, and the movie they showed us when we got into Vietnam was The Longest Day. And I thought, okay, is this an omen? Because in six, 1965, that was the big buildup uh, to go to Vietnam. As a matter of fact, going in the Navy, my physical consisted of, um, I'd done an eye chart, they listened to my heart and said, you passed. I mean, that was pretty much my physical. Um, and then, like I said, seeing the movie, um, The Longest Day, which actually has wound up to be one of my favorite. There's a lot of truth in that. Um, but we operated then a lot around the Mekong Delta area. One thing, and this is something else, a lesson that I have learned and I have taken very seriously, is one day we were to go up north, up kind of like the Hapong area, and there's these big, huge um, oil reserves up there. And like World War II with the Ploeste raids, if you cut off the oil, you're kind of cutting off the head of the snake. So they sent us up there. And I don't know who's, who ordered this, whether it was Westmoreland. He was there at the time. Um, I don't know who ordered this, but they didn't give us a lot of intel. They just said, go up, do your thing, and but okay. So we went up and um, we'd done our thing um, taking out this oil reserve. It was big. It covered miles. And I can remember at night watching, I've never seen a show like this before in my life. I had never ever seen a show like this before in my life. I think it was the Christmas of 1965 if I remember that part right. If you've ever seen Emerald an emerald sky, or have you ever seen oil or phosphorus explode at the same time? You have no clue, and I can't put it in words. I really cannot put this in words, what we were seeing that night. Uh, one of the guys that I was with, he just we were looking out at this, and he said, I can't imagine this. He said, somebody is really catching hell. And he said, I am so glad that we're here. This went on for, it was a night raid, and it went on for, oh my gosh, pretty much all night. Then the skipper, the old man as we officially called him, came on and he said, boys, we may be in a lot of trouble because I think we just sank a Dutch freighter that was sitting in there. He said, we could possibly have started World War III. And I thought, oh, this is cool, you know. <laughs> and, but as we left and we were coming back to our home port, um, he said, no, we didn't sink it. But the lesson learned there was, and it's what we told the command from this point forward, you give us the mission and let us go do it. Um, if you're not, they have a term now called boots on the ground. And we didn't have that term back then, but we told them basically, you give us the mission. And if you're not standing with me arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, then let us do our job. You just... Just stand back and let us do our job. Um, we were on the Delta, and it was a um, beautiful, beautiful summer, their summer afternoon, no monsoon or anything like that. And when that part of the world, then it, it's really a beautiful country. It really is. It reminds you a lot maybe of some of the hills of southern Ohio to maybe as you're going on into West Virginia. It's really a beautiful country. And it's hard for us to imagine, it was hard for me, I turned, I turned 18 when I was there. That was the last 17 year old to serve. Um, but we 
um, were setting, they're admiring the surroundings, and they called us to battle stations. And that, we got there, and a lot of people may not realize this, but the Vietnam, the North Vietnamese, they did have a bit of a navy. It wasn't much. Um, this is, again, this is 1965. What they had after that, I don't know. But there were two boats that come out all the way down the delta, and they got through our coastal defense, and they come out after us. So a ship scrambled the little one-seated, I think they're A4s or A6s, and somebody will have to correct me probably on that a little bit later on, but they're the one-seated interceptors. And they've got these mini guns, burp guns on them, like the Gotland guns. I forget how many barrels that are on them, but when they go off, it sounds like a semi, just zzz, zzz, and the water just foams. I mean, it just foams up. So they scrambled some of those, and one of the, we affectionately called the destroyers cans, and one of the cans came up to the Delta, and they, one of the Skyhawks hit one of these boats, and it just disintegrated. I mean, I don't know how many thousand rounds a minute those things can shoot. And the, a destroyer then was chasing one of the boats, and a little bit later on, we were given the photos of this, the pictures. And it shows um, a Vietnamese behind the pagoda, and he's hiding behind a rock. And you can actually see him. He was actually praying. The pagoda wasn't real big. It wasn't the big, fancy ones that you see maybe in the movies. It was probably 15, 20 feet maybe at the base and went up maybe two stories, something like that. And when I saw the photo, I kind of, I laughed about it. I thought, well, whatever God he's praying to didn't do him a bit of good that day. Um, you know, we had a term called a patty daddy. In other words, whatever God that he prayed to, that's how he was talking to him. And I kind of laughed about that. A little bit later on, while I was still there, I looked at that photo again and I thought, you know, that's really not funny. Um, you don't know who he left behind. Um, been married maybe, somebody's husband, somebody's brother, somebody's definitely son. Was he there because he wanted to be or was he forced into service? Um, it really wasn't funny when I thought about that after all. And I, I do have that photo and I think about that every once in a while. And I'm thinking that could be me because I am this ammo humper and they told us that if the Marines or somebody on shore need help, we're going. Or if the ship comes under fire, um, we're going to hold them off. The ship pulls out and they're supposed to come back and pick us up. Well, the gunnery sergeant said, oh, you are speed bumps, boy. He said, there is no way in the world you're going to hold anybody off. And we had another term about what part of your anatomy you could kiss. Should that happen? Um, my first real experience with wounded um, we, I was, it was late at night, like, I don't know, I had the mid-watch, so it was probably something after midnight, and I knew some of the guys were taking a pretty good pounding on the shore. We were north of the Delta, and I can't, I don't remember the, um, the Ville or anything like that, but they were north of the Delta, they were Army, and they were, they were really taking a pasting. And I was thinking, um, is this going to be the day that I'm going to have to really face this? This is going to be the day? And I come up out of the boiler room, and I come up in a passageway, and right where we came up was right where sick bay was. And as I come up, this corpsman grabbed my partner and I, and he said, um, what type, he didn't really ask, he said, what type blood you got, but he grabbed my dog tag and looked, and he said, you'll do, come on in here. And they took us right, took me right into the operating room. I mean, I wasn't more than three or four feet from this kid, and he was pretty busted up. He, he was really busted up. And um, they, uh, they put the needle in my arm, and it went straight for me into this kid. But I can remember the corpsman saying, you know, I really hate to take blood from some of you guys because he said it's so hot down there. 
what you guys are doing and your blood gets so thick. He said, it's just hard to get a, get a pint out of you guys. So we, we had done on all that. And um, I don't know how long I was there with this kid. I, I called him a kid, I was 18. Um, and I left a sick bay and I often wanted to go back to see how this kid done. My estimation, it was, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm not a medic. I was later, but it didn't look good for him. Um, it was, it was tough, and for it, nobody should have to see that. Literally, I know some of our kids today are going to Iraq, Iran, um, Afghanistan, and I know what some of these kids they're going to have to see. And my son was in the first Gulf War. He was a Marine. And my mother, when I was in Vietnam, my mother told me, because my dad, my, my parents are great parents. I mean, they, they uh, my dad taught me how to play music. He taught me how to work. He gave me a work ethic. Um, just so much that I carry today, my father passed down. And that's one of the reasons why, and one of the things he used to say was, you're going to pay taxes and you're going to serve your country. That is what a man is supposed to do. And these kids, and, w and when I was in Vietnam, I got a letter from home. I didn't write much, but I got a letter from home, and Mom was saying that Dad went to church every Sunday, never missed a Sunday going to church because he had been in World War II, the Battle of the Atlantic, the Merman's Run. His ship was hit with a kamikaze plane, so my father knew war. He'd seen it firsthand. But I heard a guy one time made a statement because of my diabetes, I got... I get some things and I got a pair of shoes, diabetic shoes, and I think um, I gave, it cost the government like a hundred and fifty some dollars for these shoes or something of that nature. And a guy, I don't think he, he was in a, was never in a service, he, he made a remark about, well it's too much, you could have got them cheaper. Th these guys are getting way too much. And I, there was something that welled up inside me, I wanted to slap the taste out of his mouth, but I said no. I, you know, you stop and think about the two most important people in the world, they're farmers and they're veterans. That's, uh, Harry S. Truman said the same thing, he was one of my favorite um, presidents, give him what for Harry. Um, and I just feel that you don't do too much for a veteran. There was a speech that was given down at Wright Pat about three or four years ago. Some of these guys, a couple of them was with Doolittle World War II fame, but they were all World War II veterans. And a couple of them gave up and gave, they gave eloquent speeches, really nice speeches, 20, 30 minutes, whatever it was. And they called up one crusty old vet, and I love this guy. He got up and he said, there's only two people that'll lay down their life for anybody. It's Jesus Christ and a veteran. And he turned around and sat down, got a standing ovation for that. So that's, that stayed with me for, Again, all of these years, the only two people that will give their life for mankind. And uh, it is true, it's Jesus Christ and a veteran. Because a veteran will never meet you, maybe. Um, doesn't know your background, doesn't know your religion, doesn't know what, what country you were originally from. I'm Scottish. Doesn't make any difference when he's called to duty. When they, he or she, when they are called to duty, they will answer duty's call.